And uh, lastly, uh, Eric's up here to talk to you about eclipses. Uh, does anyone remember uh, last month, Eric LeMay did this beautiful uh, series on the lunar eclipse that we just had in December. And uh, I uh, presented an impromptu lunar challenge, uh, basically uh, to find a photograph of the Earth during a lunar eclipse. This is not a photograph of the Earth during a lunar eclipse. It's a photograph of Apollo 17 photoshopped of what the Earth might look like during a lunar eclipse. But did, I want to ask you, did anyone find an actual photo of the Earth during a lunar eclipse? Anyone? No? Did anyone try? <laughs> Shouldn't ask that question. Well, it took me all of about 30 seconds, uh, thanks to Mr. Google. And the site uh, I found it on was very strange. This guy, he's into gothic stuff, and he happened to do a thing on lunar eclipses, which I found very bizarre. But there was a photo there of a lunar eclipse, if we can show it. This photograph was taken by the Kaguya Japanese uh, space uh, pr probe, which is orbiting the moon. Uh, I took the photo on uh, May 18th, 2009. Uh, I thought maybe the NASA Lunar uh, uh, Reconnaissance Orbiter might have taken one, but couldn't find anything there. But this is one of the few actual photos of the Earth during a lunar eclipse. And I have to specify that it's only a partial, uh, it's called a penumbral eclipse, which means the spacecraft is not quite in totality. So th this is the photo that I found. And I, I, I actually thought it was interesting that no one's looked at this more seriously as, as a way of studying the Earth. Because during a lunar eclipse, you have a very unique set of conditions under which you can uh, observe the Earth with that kind of light. Obviously, we can't duplicate those conditions. They, they can only be done by the sun. And I thought maybe a station on the moon, uh, almost dead center, where the, the equator and the meridian uh, intersect, right, right at the middle, somewhere in there, might be a good pl place to put a, uh, a small telescope that could photograph the Earth during the, the lunar eclipses, which happened, uh, if, I, if I'm uh, correct, there, there is at least two every year, is that right? Two lunar, lunar eclipses that happen at some, sometime during the year? So that's, that's two opportunities every year to uh, study the Earth from that perspective, which uh, I think is something that merits attention because we, uh, we were, we're, you know, we're looking out towards uh, the, the stars and, and galaxies, but we need to look back at the Earth as well. It's very important. I'll volunteer my telescope if you get it there. Sure. <laughs> After I win the lottery, we'll, do, we'll go together. Um, Okay, and, and uh, also, uh, I have a uh, video that I want to show you. It's, uh, uh, it's a, uh, from an excerpt from the uh, uh, dinner meeting that we had in November, where Dr. Luke Simard talks about some of the applications for the 30-meter uh, telescope being uh, built in Hawaii. And it sort of ties into this, because he's talking about how we can actually learn about a planet by the light that goes through its atmosphere and then to Earth. And that the 30 meter telescope will actually be able to analyze the, uh, what is on the planet by seeing that light going through the atmosphere of the exoplanet, which is, you know, they're very far away. And we'll actually be able to learn more about planets that way, which is similar to this idea where we're using the sun as a backlight. Uh, can we play the clip? I'm particularly, uh, I don't work on exoplanets and life in the universe, but one thing that this telescope will do really well is give us a better understanding of planets around other stars. The first thing we're going to be able to do is if you look at this uh, star here and the scale, one astronomical unit is where the Earth, the, the planets like the Earth are found, terrestrial planets, and you can see all kinds of interesting molecules in space, like water. How do we take those molecules, which are present throughout a uh, protoplanetary disk, how do we take those molecules in space and put them at the surface of new planets? We don't know, but with TMT, we're going to be able to observe 
molecules being deposited at the surface of new form, uh, newly formed uh, planets. One thing that we hope to do is find actual traces of life. And I'm not talking about ET phone home. Um, it's actually uh, kind of cooler than that. So here's a star, and you have a planet uh, around that, uh, passing in front of that star. So the light is going, the Earth is way, way, way over there. And so the, light, the rays from the star will go through the atmosphere of the exoplanet. And if we can measure the spectrum of these light rays that go through the atmosphere of the planet, we can measure the chemical abundance of atmosphere of planets around other stars. So if we can measure the chemical abundances of those atmospheres and we find something like oxygen, oxygen exists in the atmosphere of the Earth because of life at the surface of the Earth. If there was no life, oxygen would quickly react with a bunch of other stuff and disappear from the atmosphere. If we find significant amount of oxygen in an exoplanetary atmosphere, it would be a strong evidence for life. And in fact, we're going to be able to tell you whether a planet is covered by water or whether it's covered by a forest uh, or just plain rocks. So that uh, inspired me when I heard him talk about this, the light going through the, uh, the atmosphere. Maybe putting a station on the moon, we could refine that technique. And, and because we know what the Earth's atmosphere contains, it would be a good way of calibrating that technique so that when we do look at other planets very far away, we better understand what, uh, what we're looking at. Um, also, I have some videos to give. Is Sanjeev here tonight? Yes, he is. Okay, Sanjeev, I have some videos for you, for Gordon Webster and for Chuck O'Dale. Um, I'm, uh, I'm very happy to give a video to someone who's done a presentation here. Just come and see me and uh, I'll, uh, I'll uh, provide one for you if, you if you do a presentation. This is my way of thanking you for doing your presentations. They're very instructive. For me, this is a, a labor of love. I, I do this freely and, and enjoy it very much and I want to thank you again. Uh, next month will be my third year. Uh, filming and I have not missed a meeting in 36 months. Thank you.